today we'll be, we will be discussing partnership identity, where basically partnership identity is a question of how to get women more involved in the Beit Knesset. If I went to a survey, and I know you've been filmed, so you're not going to want to say the truth, but how many of you get to shul on a Shabbos morning when shul starts? Raise your hands. We've got one. You don't have to video them because they might be embarrassed, right? we got like one or two women that come to shul on time. How many of you go to shul on a daily basis? We've got one, maybe one, right? And it's one of the questions of why women aren't participating in shul. Now, maybe we should have, right? Why don't you go to shul? Why don't you go to shul? So you say, I, 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 say I. Why don't you go to shul? I do go to shul. Every day? No, not every day. Why not? I get to on my own. I don't have a requirement to be a shul. There's no requirement for me to be a part of minyan. What about on Shabbat? What time do you get to shul on Shabbat? Nine-ish, right? They're already up to what, usually? I don't know. I don't know. It is known that a lot of women just show up for Musaf. They don't go for Torah reading Musaf. Not for Torah. I mean, how many of you get there by Torah reading? Sometimes. Oh, good. That's a great show. It's not a good week. <laughs> on a good week. On a good week, we're there by Torah reading. That's a good thing. We're happy about that. A lot of times, women do not feel that they need to be at show because they don't feel that they are active participants in the Beit Knesset. And they feel that they could just be at home. Right? That they could be at home and they could down on their own and they can. Right? One of the things about Torah reading is that we actually can't do Torah reading at home. We're actually going to have it this Shabbat. We're going away to Abziv. Very exciting, yes, come to Europa, we're going away to Axie, we go to good places. Um, but one of the things that's difficult because of Corona, we can only have one family, and therefore we're not going to have a minyan on Shabbat. So what should we do? How should we acknowledge Torah reading? What should we do? Now we can't, we're going to learn if we're allowed to read Torah together, but we can't, we don't have a minyan. Right, a minyan is made up of ten men, we'll look at that in a second, how we know that. So what should we do? Should we read Torah together? Should we have one person read each other? Yeah, should we learn Torah? One of the things that we know is that when women gather together, they're not required to read Torah. And therefore, a lot of times when women get to shul, they feel that they're in a different place. They don't feel a part of the shul. In addition, think about the way that your Beit Knesset is set up, right? How is your Beit Knesset? Should say how Elazar is set up? In Elazar, and then we'll go to you, you know, because I'm talking first. So in Elazar, we have the men in the middle, right, with the bima in the middle, and the women are surrounding the men on the outside. Okay? Uh, it's yours is like that also. Yeah, balconies. Like. Balconies, with women up in balconies looking on upon what's happening down below. Very removed. Very removed. Anyone else have a different setup? Yeah. Um, Kesha and Ingrid and Kesha and Ingrid the Ten of Fly has um like it's like just like separate like down the middle. Separate. Yeah. Meaning there's an idea, and I actually sorry to say this, you know, we're, we are being filmed, and I don't want to talk bad about Israel. But a lot of times in America, there are a lot more shuls that are cognizant of the fact that women want to be active participants. So when they make the mechitza, they make it literally like this down the middle, where the bima and the chazan is over here. You know, dominating to everyone. It's actually very interesting. I'm not sure how you going. My school in Florida is like the men, and then around it, it's like the women, but it's like a one way glass, so like the women can see pretty much everything. But like, it's set up like you're, you see everything. No you see what everything, you're right? And one of the things that's very, very important for women to be able to see everything, to look down upon it, to look at what's going on. But I think we also have to try to figure out why are women not coming to show? Why don't they feel like active participants? And I feel that a lot of times it is because we are just looking upon things. We're seeing things. I mean, you tell me why you're not, yeah. I mean, a woman in my school is not even allowed to be president. Like, ah, so we've been issued. This is also something that we'll talk in the class. Are women allowed to be school presidents? Can they be act, have active roles in school? We want to, we think it's, do you think it's a value for women to come to school? Yeah. 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 You think it's better than her dominating at home, or she could have just a good dominating at home if she wants? No. Oh, no. Can, Can I speak my personal experience? Go for it. I personally like going to stop being better than dominating at home. How come? Um, because I. I actually don't know. I feel like I'm like fulfilling the mitzvah more, even though that's not true at all. Like, I know it's not true. Like, I. But, I don't know. 
do you feel like more uh, like there's something there at Shul that you like better when it's at the Shul itself? I think it's because there's like cottage and I can respond to cottage. So like things like those and like kedusha. So like yeah, that's why. Beautiful. Lira. I think it's kind of like kind of what you're saying, but I go to Shul to like feel part of the community and to like be able to be at a gathering. But why does that contradict? That's beautiful. You go to shul to be a part of the community, to feel a part of something greater, to feel like it's not just me and my home, Dominic, but I have something greater going on, and I feel more inclined. It's beautiful. Yeah. I like that Dominic is led, and like things happen in like an orderly fashion. Like I feel like if you Dominic on your own, you can like just skip whatever you want to skip. But like everything is being said when you go to shul. Like, there, there's no skipping. There's an order to it. Someone tells you when to stop. Someone tells you when to begin. Right? It's encouraging you to dive better. It feels like more of like an experience. Than more of like, an experience. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, to add on both like Tahila and Leiran, like I think like the, there's a reason that we have communal davening. There's a reason why men should and like women should, um, or men are obligated and women should. Uh, and like part of it's like the singing, like the Torah reading. Like there's a reason. Like it enhances our like davening by being with other people and like sharing that like so why not it enhances our dominating do you guys i don't know you know we we've been yeah go ahead leon sorry i'm sorry i think i would like two things for me i think going to also like feeling part of like community and like feeling like part of the so you're taking with you what you do in the minyan, in the group davening, and you're bringing it with you to your home. But you're always looking forward to that. Yeah. What has been your experience during Corona? <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's less like hectic and more missing out on my davening than missing out on the community. It's more missing out on community. So we're missing that community aspect. Yeah. We have our own prayers, but with did you go to a community davening during Corona? Right. So you went in your backyard. Oh, beautiful. So you have it in your backyard. You're there, but you're missing the major community aspect, but you're able to daven in your backyard. Yeah. It's amazing. What else? How has anyone else experienced Corona? In terms of your daven, are you, yeah. Um, well, I daven every day, like on my own, obviously. Um, but I feel like I don't really feel like I missed out on the community. That's also really nice. I'm picking up a theme that people like about shul is this idea of an experience that is not just me. Right? That I know that there's a greater picture and that also we use our community to push us forward. You know what I'm saying? Like if I'm dominating my Kabbalah Shabbat songs by myself, it's a little bit lower. But when I'm doing it with other people around, there's an experience that goes on there that pushes me forward, makes me understand it better, you know, creates a better atmosphere. And all of us during Corona have found ways to do that. You know, a lot of us have now turned our homes into mini shuls, and we dive in together. My friends, literally, when we, there was no minyan, like we have a minyan on our block, but when there's absolutely nothing possible, they opened up the chumash, and they read through the parsha. They actually laid through. Like the boys and the girls in the schools that we send our kids to, they actually learn laying of the Torah. So my kids could just open up the chumash, and they could just lay right through. And you read through aliyah after aliyah, and you have this communal experience. So we definitely like this community experience. And now the question will be, and that's why I think it's even more so during the corona year, how do we now translate what we just gained from having this community experience where women, right, Rachel, do you separate in your house, boys on one side, girls on the other? I like that, right? Oh, you really did. So you did have... Ish. You had an ish, but, like, you're all sitting there. Was there a mechitza? No, no mechitza. Everyone sitting together. Everyone davening together. It was a communal experience where a lot of women felt a part of it. I have a mind, but yeah, go ahead. Well, I think it's like, 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 I think it's like,
personally, like my school like opened up like a little bit. Like no one really go. Like some people go, but like no women go. And like if anything, like a lot of women like are less likely to even return. So no women go now because of Corona and they're nervous and etc. And they're less likely to return. I don't feel like they're necessary for like count. Like that was also we're going to get to that. That's also another question: is that when we are only allowed, let's say, twenty people in the shul, should that be the men? Should it be the women? Children? Who should be allowed in the shul if there's only a limited amount? One of the beautiful things I loved about Al Azhar was that it was the first twenty people that signed up. Man or woman, first party people that signed up, they got a seat. Obviously, you needed a, you know, a minyan, but after that, if it was men, if it was women, it didn't make a difference. Yeah. Um, this has a lot to do with corona wise, but my good family friends in Jerusalem, they have an egalitarian minyan, um, and that they do wait for 10 men, but also 10 women. Right. Ah, so that's right. That, there is definitely many that do that, where they wait for the 10 men and the 10 women. We're going to speak about, uh, we're, we'll speak about that. So first of all, I just want to point out one of the things that I experienced during Corona was that on our shul, we actually have a minyan. I love it. And there's like on our balcony, on our near Passat, we can just stand there and hear the minyan. If there's a good chazan, we got a really good one, actually. And you can hear his voice throughout the entire neighborhood. And we just sit there and we all come together to be a part of it. So therefore, we feel, both men and women, mamash, very much a part of it. And that's why I think that when women feel a part of it, they feel, you know, even more inclined to come to shul. They feel bet they feel that they better their dominant. And that's why we have to think about in our modern day, where both men and women know how to read and have the time to come to come to shul. How can we be a part of shul in a meaningful way that still follows Orthodox law? Right? That still still follows the halakha. What are the possibilities? So that's where I want to take you to source number one on the page. Source number one talks about Torah reading itself. We'll talk about the different areas. We're going to start off with Torah reading. And there is a Gemara, Masachar Megillah, that starts off the following way. Tana Rabbanan. Hakol olin l'minyan shiva, v'afilu katan v'afilu isha. Aval amru chachamim isha lo tikra b'torah v'pnei kavod ha'tzibor. So the Gemara states that everyone goes up to be a part of the seven. Hakol olim the minyan shiva. Everyone, how many aliyot do we have from Torah reading? Seven. Seven. Everyone can get an aliyah. Even a young child, even a woman. Aval amru chachamim chachamim said, Isha lo tikra b'Torah, a woman cannot read from the Torah, mipnei kavod ha'tzibor, because of the honor of the congregation. That was my question to you. What does that mean? Yeah. Um, is that Kolisha? Is, is that, that Kolisha? I mean, it doesn't look like it. That's a beautiful point. Is that Kolisha? Right? It doesn't say Kolisha. And in fact, for the fact that it doesn't say Kolisha, we learn here that it's not a Kolisha issue. Meaning a woman is really allowed to get an aliyah. In essence, she can get an aliyah, but she shouldn't do so, not because of Kolisha. Meaning Kolisha... At, when we're looking at this, doesn't seem to be a problem. So if she's getting up and reading the Torah in her nice sing-song voice, it's not Kalisha. Right? It's not an issue of Kalisha. It's another issue. It's an issue of Kavod So go ahead. What do you want to say? Me. Me. Who was the one who said I don't know. Yeah, Sky. Good. Ah. We know if a woman were to get up in late, it would be embarrassing for the man. Why, why would that be embarrassing? Because, like, um, she would be like seen as a higher stature than him. She would be seen as a higher stature from him. Why? Because she can do the laning and he can't. Right? Back in the day, way back when, why. one of the reasons, we're going to see that for the Kriya Shema, for, um, for Birkata Mazon, I'll bring it in in a second. We're going to see in Birkat Mazon that one of the things that happens is that a woman is not allowed to read from the Torah, or should have read from the Torah here, because she's going to make the man feel embarrassed. Back then, women were not taught how to read. They weren't. There were very few exceptions, and we actually heard about those exceptional women, the ones who did learn how to read. Now, they were amazing, but the normative woman was not taught how to read. And therefore, if she gets up and reads to the Torah, what is that saying about the men? 
What, there's no man here that can get up and read from the Torah? What, there's no one else around? We have to call the woman, the ignorant, the ignorant woman, to get up and read? That's embarrassing. And therefore, it wasn't appropriate for the Tzibur. That's definitely one of the explanations. Yes? You don't like that? No, I used to it's a, such a thing for women not to read from the Torah. Maybe, I mean, there are other reasons that you presented, so like obviously others, but this is one of the reasons why you don't read from the Torah right now. Like, I don't know, because... So what don't you like about it? You think, what's bothering you about it? Times have changed. Women are more educated, and I think the point of the Torah and modern orthodoxy, well, that's why this is modern orthodoxy, I mean, orthodox community, very different. So you're saying women today learn Tanakh, learn Gemara, right? We learn all those subjects here in Midrash Sharona. We learn all those subjects here in Midrash Sharona, <laughs> right? So Gemara and Tanakh, we're learning those subjects matter. We're educated women. We learn the Torah. We know the Torah. I mean, why wouldn't we read Torah? So the question is today that we can or does Kavod Atzibor change? Now we try to figure out what is Kavod and Sibor. Yeah. I don't really like, I know like, I shouldn't say this, but I don't understand why women like, has to read the Torah. Like, I don't think that in Judaism, like, men and women are supposed to be the same, they're supposed to have like, the same like, type of like, mixed vote and like, opportunities. So like, like, if we, like, people, I don't think equaling the playing field is making everything the same. Like, there can be another way to like, make women more involved. Beautiful. So I don't know why you apologize at the beginning for saying that. I don't know because we're all talking about like why. No, it's really important to get both ideas. There's no reason to apologize for that idea. I think it's also important, mm -hmm. right? On the other hand, maybe we should be having different roles. I just said to you, you know, are you going to shul? Are you a part of the shul? But right, one of the things that you're saying is that maybe we should have different roles in the shul. Maybe our role is not to get up and read in front of the tzibur. Maybe we should be doing the private prayers in our home. Maybe that's an ideal. It's not that we're losing out from it, but it's an ideal. There's something there where men and women have different roles within Judaism. Just like a follow-up, I just think that like everything like we try, like we try to like justify like all the reasons why we can or cannot do everything that men can do. Like, like I don't know, like we like look at our own soul and like look at the totality of what we can do and what we can't do. There's like less of them, but like we look at them as like okay, like whatever, like whatever that was. Like, why can't we do this? Why can't we do what they do? Like I don't know, I have like a problem with that. And I think so. We have to analyze it. Do, should we be having separate roles for women and men? And does that continue to exist today? Better? <laughs> yes. Um, wait, I just want to elaborate on this. Like, I totally agree with you, but like, I don't think we're talking about the same role at all. But, like, then again, I think we should, yeah, we probably should be having women in like, different areas, not think that they can participate, but, like, so that's the thing. Should we make them participate, or maybe their role should be on the outside? I think that's what Aviva was saying. That like, it's just a different place in the shul. Right. Yeah. Um, I think like nowadays, like when it's not uncommon to have like a woman scholar in residence rather than like a man, and I don't think any man in the shul feels inferior because he wasn't chosen over like a really scholarly, like Harvard educated, like whatever woman to give like a Dvar Torah or like a Shear then I think the same principle can be applied here, like, right? Like, I don't think any man would feel like, I'm so embarrassed, like, there's a woman up there, like, giving a shear and not me. So I think the same principle should be applied here. Like, it seems like they're kind of equivalent. Beautiful. That if you're having women being scholar in residence and speaking to the shul and coming and saying their knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, so why wouldn't they be able to read Torah? It's the same thing. I think you're in a unique place because I'm not sure everyone has women's scholar residence in their shul, do they? We do, but... You do? No, no. no. What is that? No. Is that but maybe, but maybe. Those two, and we're moving in the direction for sure. And there are massive debates about that. Should the woman speak at shul? Does the woman speak in the middle of shul? Does she speak afterwards? Does she speak at night? Does she speak to both men and women? And there are all different variations amongst all your different shuls. And I think that that's the very question. How do we get women's participation? And when a woman speak, speaks at a shul event, you know, like a scholar residence, are there the same amount of men and women that attend? 
Are there more women? Are there more men? How does that actually work? But I think that's also one of the solutions to get more women to come to shul, to educate more women, to pro provide programming for both. Ariella. I just think that's very, I mean, I know in my shul, like, if a woman does speak and it's just to the women, it's not to the men, and, like, people get really mad about that. I just think it's really backwards thinking. Like, we're, we're in 2020, and, I mean, look at all over the world. I mean, it's still in so many areas when they're only coming into, like, positions really late, but I just think in the whole Judaism, it's quite backwards thinking in regards to women. So you're saying, in your shul, there are people that get upset when women only speak to women? And you think that that's, it's like, okay, agree. women should speak to everyone else, right? They shouldn't just speak to the one guy. Because it's not like they're speaking about, like, puberty or whatever, that something should be like that. It's like a general shit. A general shit should be given to both men and women. We live in a mixed society where men and women are used to hearing from both genders. Why not? So I hear that that debate going on there, yeah. In my show, like, last year or two years ago, they're trying to get more women to, like, participate. So, like, Jesus and Mechitza, it was halfway through, and they, like, tried to get women to speak. But they really wanted to speak. They got one woman to speak, and like girls speaking about mitzvahs, and that's it. Like they want women don't really want to like take part like that. So it's really hard. So they're not that. So the, is it really hard that we should push them, or maybe we should take a view of this idea of like, no, this is where they are. Why should we keep on pushing them? On the other hand, maybe we want those girls to be part of it. Well, I think. Yeah. One. One sec. Yeah. Go ahead. I think it often depends on what the rabbi of the shul, like what his ruling is. Like in my Nariella shul, like. Our rabbi doesn't let us speak for our bar mitzvahs, like in front of the shul. He's very backwards thinking. Shira's rabbi will let um, her speak at her bar mitzvah in the shul. I think it's all down to the rabbi and like whether the community wants something, the rabbi won't change and it's what he says goes. Because I think that what we're getting at is this question of kavod at Sibor. Can the Sibor change? Right? Can we change things? Is our Sibor different for each and every congregation? We could say a law, great, every woman get an aliyah, but if we walk into Maya Sharp, that's just not going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, it's just not there. On the other hand, there's also a halakhic piece that we have to understand here that we didn't get to just yet, if Kabbalah de Sibor still, in fact, applies today. So that's not so much what's up to every community, that's mamash a halakhic piece that we have to understand, which we'll get back to. But you can see that all these ideas of women's participation in the community now is changing, and people are trying to find their, their footing and trying to find something that's appropriate for their congregation and making women feel a part of it. Yes? I'm just trying to apply this what we learned earlier in the year with people who are talking about the intro and one of the commentators said that like, it's not ideal, but if it's going to bring a woman closer to Hashem and make her feel connected and make her come to school, then should we let them do it? So, like, I don't need to read the Torah. I have no interest whatsoever. I'm fine with going to school and having your business. Like, I know people who love, like, friends who love reading from the Torah. So, like, I mean, like, that's why there's women's tefillah. And, like, I understand, like, if a woman doesn't do it, it it's more of, like, a mitzvah, you know, right? Because like, you do need ten men. Or, yeah, you, do, you need a minion in order to read from the Torah. So, but, like, I don't really see the problem in having a woman's tefillah group where the woman reads. Like, that's, what, that's how she feels connected to you. And so we're going to have to go through that. I'll just point out one thing. For the Shabbat in, you know, up north, what do you think we decided to do? Right? We have Torah reading, but we're not going to be able to read from the Torah because we don't have a minion. So what do you think we should do? Read it Who should read it? Mm -hmm. One of our thoughts, don't tell anyone, but one of our thoughts was to get seven different girls to read from the Torah, and that way we will have at least seven purchasements at the shul. You know, it's like seven women come to shul down. If I call upon seven women to come to Torah reading, what's going to happen? Seven girls are going to come. And guess who's going to support her? Three or four of her friends who are going to support her reading. And then already we've got lots of girls coming and davening in our communal davening. Amazing. So that is one of the thoughts. The more people participate, the more they feel attached, the more they feel the need to come. Yes? So, like, for me, I really agree with Aviva. Like, I don't feel that, like... I always need to even the playing field and I don't feel like I'm so left out of my community and like that's not something personal to me but I also think that like if within halachic ramifications and halachic boundaries it's 100% okay and kavod tzibor means something else these days I think maybe in a community where that's okay and that's accepted and that's like it, if that's allowed and that's what people want and it's halachically permissible then like why what? 100%. why not? So that's the question. That, and that's really the question we have to get to, is is it halakhically permissible? And if it is halakhically permissible, I also don't think that we need to like implement that in Meisha Arim. Like, right. 
Where can we implement it if it's halakhically permissible? And that's why we have to continue on and look through the sources. Source number two is the Tosefta. The Tosefta begins, Hakol olim minyan shiva, afilu isha, afilu katam. Ein nevimet isha likrot lirabim. What does the Tosefta add on here? Or not add on? Well, he's saying that it's the reasoning. He's almost saying the reasoning that they can't is because they don't understand better. Is that a reasoning here? Ain maybe What is his reason? Oh wait, Ain Mavin saying they don't understand how to read for many people? So they don't have to understand how to read what? It says Ain Mavi Matishali Kurlarabi. We don't bring the woman to read in the major population. What's missing here is the Kavoda Tibor. It doesn't talk about Kavoda Tibor in the Tosef. Oh maybe in is bring. I thought it was understanding. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. okay. I'm translating, sorry. Everyone can get an aliyah to be a part of the seven, even a woman, even a young child, that's the same, right? A woman and a young child, they all are part of the minyan, you know, the shiva. Ein mevi'im isha, we don't bring a woman to read Burabim. And it doesn't take out, it takes out the kavod tibor aspect to it, right? We don't bring a woman to read for the community. So now we... What? It didn't He's just saying, like, we don't do it. Like, it was just last then. Now, we have to also understand what was the institution of Kriyata Torah back then. Right? What was Kriyata Torah at the time that the Gemara was written there? Yeah. Beautiful. It's definitely one person reading. The question is, who's getting a Leo? What's it like nowadays? How does a person get an Aliyah? They pay for it. They, <laughs> they don't always pay for it. They get an Aliyah. I should have sharpened my question. Um, the question is, what does it look like in action when a man gets up and gets an Aliyah? So let's walk through it. He goes up on the bima. What A bar flu. He says a bracha. Right? Then he says the bracha bracha to Torah. First, like, Tama. Right. For a first, they call him up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Ivar come up, we call his name, we say his full name, beautiful, he comes up, he comes up, the pointer shows him where they are in the Torah, he kisses that place, not during Corona, he kisses that place, and then he says, Baruch and then he says, the Birkata Torah, and then what happens? Then the whole congregation yeah. responds. The whole congregation responds, beautiful, he stands there, and then he reads. He reads. The Baal Kore, someone else, someone else is reading. Right, someone else is going through the reading, and then the person getting al- the aliyah says the after bracha. Beautiful. Back then, it wasn't like that. Right? It says, let's look at the Orach HaShokhan to talk about the background. Every single one of the readers says a bracha beforehand and afterwards. It's not similar to the Birkat Torah that we say in the morning because those were instituted, for, uh, this was instituted for Kavod Torah. Right? Every single morning when you wake up, you say Birkat Torah. Why do you say Birkat Torah? To prepare you for a day. So you to prepare you. Some of you learned it in the oh, yeah. No, we, no, we learned it. Okay. So why do we say Birkat uh, Torah? So you need to bless the Torah. It's like a really out there. How about just to appreciate the fact that the Torah comes from God and every yeah, single... Oh, 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 oh. All right. That's also what it says in the Mishnah Bura, where we talk about it there. Fine. There are lots of different reasons. Got it. Come to other classes. We'll learn lots of other reasons. <laughs> but perhaps we say that the, the idea of Birkat Torah is a blessing on the actual learning of Torah. Right? Before we can actually learn Torah, we have to have something which is a matir, which allows us to do it. And saying Birkat Torah allows us to learn Torah. It actually puts the focus on Torah, that it's not just about me having this intellectual debate and feeling good in my mind, but really the idea that I'm blessing God for the ability to learn the Torah. And therefore, is that the same bracha that we say now? No. Rather, this bracha is for Kavod Torah. Right? That basically he's saying that if you just said Birkata Torah right now and then they call you up for an aliyah, 
You have to say the bracha again. Even though you just said it, you said Birka Torah, you gave a lick for Shul, never happens. But you gave a lick for Shul and you just said Birka Torah, they call you up for an aliyah, you mamish have to say Birka Torah one more time. Because it's something different. So we're talking about the fact that Birkat Torah is something special that we say on the fact that we are reading Torah, Kavod HaTorah. That's different from learning Torah. 